Hello, everyone. This is Dieta Jones, and I would like to welcome you to our live webinar series. Uh, we very much look forward to spending the next hour having a conversation with you about uh, systems thinking as a tool that can be added to your toolkit for uh, your inclusive manager aspirations and practices. Uh, this webinar is going to be co-facilitated by myself and Tyler Zuba, who is um, going to really guide us through thinking about uh, the application of systems thinking tools and structures in ways that are useful and helpful for your organization. So very much looking forward to our time together uh, today. So Tyler, let us, let us tell you a little bit about Deanna Jones and Associates to get us started. So Deanna Jones and Associates is a consulting firm uh, with wonderful uh, and very kind of multifaceted array of consultants who work in a variety of different industries. We work in industries that it represent uh, for-profit, not-for-profit, uh, academic, uh, librarianship. Um, we come from backgrounds that include things like instructional design and organizational development, uh, leadership and management, um, and equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, human resources, of course, is one of those. And our consulting team, all of whom are not represented on this image, unfortunately, um, is a group of people that brings a lot of really wonderful lived experiences. So really honored that um, this group of folks has come together in order to try to bring you some of the skills and practices that we hope will be helpful um, as part of your leadership journey. Um, one of the things that I want to point out right at the top of this webinar is that we are going to be posting uh, this webinar, the archived version, to our YouTube channel. The YouTube channel URL is right here on the screen. So uh, please visit the YouTube channel and chime in with any comments or questions that you have about any of the previous webinars. And also know that this webinar will be available um, shortly after uh, the live offering. So if you want to go back and review it or share it with colleagues or friends, please do. We'd love for you to do that. We are offering these as an opportunity for us to kind of share some content that people ask us about pretty regularly. But most importantly, we created this webinar series for you to connect with each other. And so we'll be inviting you to do that. This is an opportunity for people who are doing the work of leading and managing complex organizations to be able to talk with other people who are leading and managing complex organizations or in complex environments or in times that are changing. And you do not have to be a formal leader or manager, of course, to be able to take advantage of this webinar series. This is for anyone in any role in any kind of organization. And we're really committed to constantly pushing out as much content as we can that crosses the variety of needs and expectations you express. So if you have ideas about additional topics that we're not covering here or now or we haven't yet covered, no worries, just let us know and we'd be happy to uh, start working on that. So just to tell you a little bit about Tyler and myself. Um, I have been, this slide is generous. It says for more than 20 years, it's been almost 30 years now where I've been doing work as an interculturalist and an organizational development uh, specialist uh, in, in and across a variety of different industries. So as an interculturalist, my, uh, my work has been really understanding and navigating um, culture. What does culture look like and behave like from a sociological and anthropological point of view? And also, what are some of the implications for organizations and for people who are leading or working in uh, organizations as far as understanding and navigating culture and the dynamics associated with human behavior? And so I bring that perspective as the foundation of my educational experience, but also my practitioner uh, role. I uh, launched Dieta Jones and Associates in 2005 um, and have since then continued to do a lot of the same work around organizational effect effectiveness and transformation. I have had the great fortune and wonderful um, experiences associated with creating what is now about 13 leadership development programs all over the world. Um, I've worked with people at every stage of their leadership journey, and uh, now I'm really in a wonderful role of being able to work with a, an amazing consulting team to make sure that we, uh, a lot of us, have the tools and resources and, and structures necessary to be able to bring 
uh, what we need and what you need in ways that are really reflective of the contemporary challenges that you're facing. Tyler, can you jump in and say a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Tyler Zuba. Uh, I'm currently working as the Manager for Learning and Organizational Development at Dieta Jones and Associates. Um, and it's been fantastic, like Dieta said, to be able to work with people at so many different places in their leadership and management journeys. Uh, my background is in uh, primarily libraries. I worked at the University of Rochester River Campus Libraries for several years as a science librarian, a branch manager, and a program manager. Um, took a little jaunt into healthcare analytics and helping uh, healthcare decision makers make better decisions with data. And, uh, and now that I'm here with Dieta Jones and Associates, I manage our um, learning and organizational development capacities, both delivering webinars like this, workshops, um, leadership and management uh, to all sorts of different clients, and uh, organizational development around strategic planning uh, and thinking through systems better, which is going to be the focus of our webinar today. I do want to point out one thing before we launch in. In the chat of this webinar, I've posted a link to a handout which uh, has a few questions for you to think about and you can also take that handout with you um, to continue reflecting on your, uh, on your journey through systems thinking. Uh, but with that, Dieta, do you wanna take us through that pre-work? Happily. Okay, so in advance of the webinar, we sent out a couple of questions just to get you thinking. And we'd love for you to jump on in at this point. So you know a little bit about Tyler, you know a little bit about me, you know a little bit about our, our hope that this is an engaging experience with and for you. Think about the answers to these two questions and chime on into the chat session or the chat window and let us know what some of your answers are. So the question is, reflect on a challenge you've encountered repeatedly in your work. Uh, a problem that seems to come up over and over again and that you're not sure how to address sustainably over time. Perhaps you've tried many solutions, but the problem keeps resurfacing. What are some of the challenges that come to mind? And without breaking confidentiality, share, share a little bit about some of the specific challenges that you wrestle with most typically that have some of these characteristics. Let's hear from you. Make sure as you type that you, that you select all panelists and attendees so that we can all see it. Resistance to change. That's a good one. Anything else? Anyone else? Trust me, I spend my life on the road talking with people about these kinds of issues. I know that everybody's got one of these. Tell us about them. Share with us. What's on your mind? People working in silos. Yeah, that's a really good one. Our organizational silos. Um, Steve Weber says resources are limited and there are always plans to stop doing anything. <laughs> When it comes to actually doing, it's hard to identify the right things to stop. Yep, yep. Oversight of details and argumentative team members. Mm -hmm. Francine, looking for ways to cut work for my staff as staffing is shrinking, is cut to part-time. Yep, opacity of decision-making. Oh gosh, yes, perfect examples. I love that, opacity of decision-making. That's fantastic language. <laughs> Yes, these are the kinds of things that are perfect for really identifying here. Rena says, creating a work environment for all staff, <coughs> for staff with mental health issues. Fantastic example of an EDI issue. <coughs> How it is that we even um, know about all the different um, uh, resources available, but either even the kinds of mental health issues that exist that we want to be responsive to when we don't always have access to those. Catherine Martinez says, resistance to change and change fatigue. <coughs> Fantastic. These are perfect examples. So isn't it good that we're all here in the same place together so we can all really wrestle with these together? Now, I promise you that we will not, by the end of this hour, have any of these things solved. If they were that solvable, they wouldn't be a systems issue. 
if they were easy to solve, you wouldn't be here talking about, you know, what, what new ways of looking at this and new skills and tools might we use. But instead, what we want to do is give you some ideas and also give you um, some uh, encouragement to go back to your organizations and sit together with colleagues and say, what new thinking and or new approaches might we bring to these challenges because not addressing them is not an option, not really. You know, in our contemporary workplace environments where, where our budgets are shrinking or the number of staff lines that we have available to us or where the number of new things that we're expected to do keeps increasing, we just do not have the option of not really rethinking some of the things that have been challenges for a very long time. And so, you know, let, let's move some of these things from what may have been the optional category in the past to the not optional category and then think about some techniques for moving forward. With that said, let me tell you a little bit about kind of lay the stage for this. First thing, systems thinking, the way that we'll describe it to you today is comes from kind of a very Western point of view, the, the philosophy and the, and the research comes from people who are US based and who have been incredibly successful um, and who have been, their, their um, ideas have been incredibly effective not just in US-based institutions, but uh, things that I've shared with people from around the world, actually. However, it is important to know that as we are thinking about kind of whose reality is centered, that uh, for this particular webinar, that there is wisdom that has come for 5,000 plus years about systems, right? And so the way that we'll talk about it today is one particular slice that hopefully will be useful, but organizations and individuals and cultures for thousands of years have been thinking about systems and how systems interrelate with one another, right? And how uh, touching one part of a system has an impact on many other parts of a system. And so what we are, are acknowledging right here at the very beginning is that uh, systems thinking is something that uh, long predates the, the philosophy and the perspective that comes from um, the, the people that we'll cite today, um, and that there's a lot of wisdom that we can and, and, and should continue to draw from all over the world and throughout history. With that said, I want to share with you uh, the, the citation associated with how we will think about systems thinking for today. It comes from the work of Peter Senge and Chris Argerus and other people who um, are kind of uh, big name organizational development gurus who come with very heavy kind of academic uh, credentials, who have worked with organizations all over the world, and whose research and design has helped organizations all over the world. The, the book it, that their wisdom is contained in is called The Fifth Discipline. There's also another book called The Fifth Discipline uh, Field Book, which is meant to be kind of the more tactical approach to The Fifth Discipline. Both of them are pretty heavy duty academic. Um, and they're, they're thick. So what we're going to do is give you some of the snippets and then let you deep dive if you'd like to. The fifth discipline is really understanding how organizations um, interact, uh, the different parts of organizations interact in ways that allow an organization to learn and grow um, by adjusting its internal capacity in order to respond to changes in the environment and also trace, stay true to mission. It's a really, really wonderful framework and I um, have been teaching it for a dozen years now, um, two dozen probably, all over the world and people find it incredibly meaningful. Um, and so I really encourage you to take a look and do a deeper dive on the learning organization if you're interested. In the learning organization, which is the, the work that they designed together, there are five disciplines, which is why it's called the fifth discipline. Of the five disciplines associated with organizational learning, what Peter Senge says is that systems thinking, which is one of the five disciplines, is the most important. It's the one that if we could really crack this nut, we could actually make some pretty monumental changes and transformations in our organization's effectiveness and well-being over time which is why the book is called The Fifth Discipline. And so when you think about these five disciplines, really understanding that the fifth discipline, which is systems thinking, is the one that they're even prioritizing is useful for you to know. So let me just describe the, the systems thinking. 
this is a beautiful description of how systems interact and not all of our brains work this way. So don't worry if your brain doesn't work this way where causal loop diagramming is something natural to you. Don't worry, we'll give multiple options for interacting with this content. But basically what systems thinking does is it says we need to have different ways of doing analysis that allow us to not just understand the detail level complexity, but also the dynamics of an issue or a problem. Oftentimes, especially when I'm in organizations, what I um, find people doing is looking at an event and then responding at the detail level or at the symptomatic level. This thing happened, therefore we need to respond with this, right? Which is helpful sometimes. But for naughty problems, K-N-O-T-T-Y problems, things that are recurring, like the things that you just described in the chat session, a systems approach is probably going to allow you to dig a little bit deeper. And let me just give a reference here. So Senge has a really wonderful and very easily accessible article. It's not brand new. It's, a, it's, it's quite old, actually. But let me, it's, called, it's called The Leader's New Work, uh, Building a Lear Learning Organizations. And it was uh, published in the Sloan Management uh, Review and it, from 1990. And, and in it, Senge describes systems thinking uh, in these ways. What he says is that systems thinking is about seeing interrelationships, not just snapshots. So think about in your organization. Are you a snapshot type of organization? In your organization is the typical or common practice to try to capture data at a very specific point in time and then use that to tell a story, right? If so, it, it sometimes is satisfying and a lot of times it's not, right? Think about staff resistance to change is one of the issues that just came up in the chat window. It's really hard to take a very specific snapshot at a very particular point in time and say, yep, we accomplished it, right? And so thinking about interrelationships between different dynamics or dimensions of an issue. Another one of the things that he describes in his article is moving beyond blame. A lot of times when we're looking at or diagnosing problems in organizations, what people naturally and quickly do is try to figure out who's to blame, who did what wrong, and how do we fix either it or them. And systems thinking is an invitation to move beyond individuals' um, failures or non-compliance and really look at what are the systems or the conditions under which people are being put and or encouraged, sometimes incentivized to do things that are antithetical to our own aspirations. It's also about distinguishing detail level complexity from dynamic complexity. And Tyler will talk about that more and give us some really good examples. And it focuses on areas of high leverage. So what, what systems thinking does is it allows us to look at a, a, an issue, to look at the different parts and relationships, and then to be able to say, if we were going to intervene, where would the point of highest leverage be, right? Where is it that we could switch, touch this one specific area and we'd have the most return on investment versus touching a whole lot of specific areas or just solving at the problem level? Right. And then the final thing that's come that comes up in the article is that systems thinking allows us to or encourage us to avoid symptomatic solutions or just putting out the same fire year after year. So that's my high level overview and a couple of, you know, a, 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 get books, examples of why this is important for you to be thinking about. And now I'm going to hand off to Tyler. Great. Thank you, Dieta. So with that introduction in mind, I'm going to zoom into another of the models that, um, that Senge uses looking at how, uh, as Dieta said, we tend to look towards surface level events, but there are patterns and structures underlying those things. I'll give a brief description and then we'll zoom in on an example. So as you see in this pyramid, uh, events, we can think of these sort of as the tip of the iceberg, you know, the smallest bit of the iceberg is above the water, but that's all, all that we can see. So events, these are actual observable data. These are the things that we see occur that we often try to respond to quickly with small interventions and repeatedly. So many of the issues that you all brought up in the chat are things that it's easy for us to see events. Um, 
my staff is shrinking. I'm dealing with resistance to change. This initiative isn't going the way that I had hoped. Um, and we see those things crop up again and again and again. Systems thinking allows us to take those events and first connect them into patterns. What exactly is it that's occurring over and over? And how do those events connect with each other into cycles? And then once we have those patterns in mind, we're able to look even deeper to what are the structures? What other cause and effect relationships might underlie the, what, what we're seeing and the patterns that we observe? And as Dieta said, where could we apply leverage? Where could we spend our effort to try to alter what structures exist, what patterns arise from them, and then the events that we'd like to see? So let's, uh, let's take a look at an example. So here's an example of a naughty issue that comes up pretty often uh, in almost every context. Um, we've talked a lot in, um, in our society and in our organizations about needing inclusion, needing more diversity, needing more equity. So an organization comes to this, uh, this issue, we need a more inclusive environment. The very first thing that they do, they see they need more diverse representation. Often the intervention that we take is we hire somebody. We say, great, we'll make somebody uh, part of our organization who can be responsible for, quote, doing diversity, whatever that means. And we put them into that position, we might give them some resources. And then one of two things happens most often. Either that staff member is stretched too thin they have too many things on their plate, they're unable to really gain traction across a complex organization, and they don't succeed. Either they stay in their role and mire around, perhaps they leave, but we find ourselves back in the same place. Instead, if they're able to succeed, we have a different problem. That success becomes well known at their organization and elsewhere, and lo and behold, that staff members recruited away because they were fantastic, their work was known and other people wanted to hire them. Our staff member leaves and we're back at hiring somebody. So with that, uh, with that in mind, I'm sure a lot of you have seen uh, cycles that look like this in your organizations, whether this issue or something else. Let's zoom in on this with our events, patterns and structures lens. So first thinking about events, these are the things that we see on the surface. So the first thing that we see, we see somebody being hired, and then either that person leaves or they're stretched too thin, they don't succeed, maybe we need to hire somebody else or grow that department. These are the easy things for us to point to and where we see this intervention come up, there's a problem, let's address it with a particular intervention, a particular event. The problem here though, as you is really obvious in this diagram, but harder to see in the real world, is that the way out that we uh, propose will work, hiring a person, leads us right back into the same issue if the system remains the way it is. Once we do a little bit of this analysis, we can begin to see the patterns. So we're hiring people, we see other organizations go through the same sorts of things, where these two outcomes happen very frequently. We hire somebody and either it doesn't work out and we need to maybe hire somebody else and find ourselves in the same boat, or that person does fantastic, they leave and we need to hire somebody else to keep their, their work functioning, but it keeps us in the same cycle. From there, we can zoom out. Once we see what's happening, once we see the events, connect them into patterns, we can examine the, the overall structure and start to imagine what kinds of questions could we be asking or what kinds of other interventions could we take that would break us out of this system? So first at the top, we need more diverse representation. Okay, first of all, what does diverse mean? What does representation mean? What does inclusion mean? Does that connect to values of our organization? Does it connect to particular teams, particular groups? We may need some more definition there rather than going directly Is there commitment? Is there uh, 
is there existing teams that may need to bear on that work, other resources in the organization that we could leverage? We talk about hiring a person to quote, do diversity. What exactly is that work? I'm sure most of us have ended up in so many roles um, that are either ill-defined or we don't have a clear sense of what's being asked of us. So we may also be able to leverage some intervention there. What are we asking this person to succeed at? And is it sustainable beyond them? And then on the right, um, so often the lack of success comes from that either too broad or too ill-defined portfolio. The staff member feels stretched too thin, isn't able to create the, uh, the environment just on their own across an organization? Are there other resources we can put in? Are there uh, additional resources that that staff member needs? Is it a spot at the table in different committees or, or boards or groups? Or is it a matter of bringing other people in uh, from other roles around the organization? As you can see, when we start to think in this systems way at where are, uh, where, what patterns are we creating and recreating? And how might we be able to break outside of those patterns or apply some leverage in some of these areas? We can start to come up with more creative solutions. Now, it doesn't guarantee that the first thing we try will work, but it does allow us to think more creatively and to examine our, uh, our work more broadly. I'm gonna pause here for a second. I've gone through a lot of things very quickly. Dieta had also mentioned in the chat, please feel free to post questions or comments as we're going and, uh, and I'll try to keep an eye out over there. But with this sort of events, patterns and structures model in mind, I'd like to ask you um, to take a moment either now or later. We asked you earlier to identify a challenge, and some of you generously uh, listed those in the chat. What may be helpful, let's try to consider the events, patterns, and structures that underlie that challenge. So first, what events do you see occurring? What are you observing? Second, what patterns connect those events? Um, it can be very helpful at this point um, to start thinking about we may believe that we understand how these events connect, but what other factors might be playing into it? Is it time of year? Is it location in the organization of individuals or groups? Is it, is it budget? Is it personalities? What patterns connect these things? And then having those patterns in mind, what structures are there that we can either investigate or modify to, um, to exert a little bit of leverage and begin to work within or change the systems. Another application we might consider is what's called a causal loop diagram. And I'm gonna flip back to this slide um, with this uh, naughty issue of needing a more inclusive environment. This diagram with events and arrows connecting them is called a causal loop diagram. And this is one of the, uh, the primary tools in the uh, systems thinking toolbox. What may be helpful in examining the challenges that you all are thinking of is to try to draw a structure like this. Now, not everyone's brain works this way really well. Some people need a little bit more practice with it. It takes time and effort to do this kind of analysis. So don't give up right away. Start with events. What do you see happening? It can be helpful to just sketch those out on a large piece of paper and then begin to ask what influences these events? How do those events connect with each other? What happens in between? What factors cause those events uh, and cause them to increase in frequency or, or, uh, or volume? And also what factors slow those events? What, serve as, what, uh, what factors serve as balancing forces to keep those things in check or keep them steady? Try to go beyond immediate cause and effect. We'll look at an example in a moment where uh, there is some pretty clear cause and effect, but also some factors external to the system we might think of initially. It can be so useful in systems thinking to try to look beyond, look at the broader scope of your organization and what 
personalities or events or times of year or external factors bear on our, uh, our system that we have in mind. Now this can be probably, I would say, the hardest part of both causal loop diagramming and of systems thinking generally, because it can feel overwhelming to broaden further and further and further. There can be too many factors. So be judicious in what you choose. You don't need to explore everything right away, but try to select one or two things that are outside the immediate system that you're looking at that have influence on the ability of people to do particular work or to, um, or to move forward with initiatives that they're hoping to move forward, the kinds of things that some of you were describing in the chat. Looking over at the chat, I see uh, Elizabeth, you might have been trying to type something and uh, I hope you're coming back to the rest of it. Please feel free to add things uh, as we go. Um, and then the last question here, thinking about causal loop diagramming, once you have a pretty robust diagram that you think captures a number of the factors leading into, uh, into the system you have in mind. Where else could you apply leverage to work within or change the system? So thinking about this particular model, I highlighted a few things that we might, uh, that we might try to intervene around. There are other places we could look that may be less effective. I chose not to highlight the success of this person becoming well known or them being recruited away because first of all, we want the success of our staff and our colleagues to be well known and celebrated. And also when people do good work, sometimes they do get recruited away and we can celebrate that. Not necessarily a bad thing. So I chose to highlight a couple of things that this hypothetical organization might be able to think of internally. So not everything needs leverage applied to it, but we can choose uh, some particular areas to work on. I wanna be mindful of our time. It is 1.33 and I wanna leave some time for us to have some back and forth and Q and A. Um, but while you're thinking about those things and perhaps starting to sketch a little bit about the uh, the systems that you have in mind that you may want to examine further for events, patterns, and structures, and also maybe do some diagramming on. I want to walk through another example that I think will resonate, uh, another way for us to think about this. So like I said at the beginning, my background is in libraries, and particularly as a science liaison librarian. And just in case uh, others in the chat aren't, av aren't aware of exactly what that looks like, my role was to respond to and support the academic work of, uh, in my example, the physics, optics, and astronomy departments at the University of Rochester. So sort of a catch-all, helping people find information, making sure we have resources that we need uh, for research and teaching, myself going out and teaching classes, uh, collaborating with people on space needs, uh, all manner of things. And what happens very frequently in a situation like this, or really any service-based role, we see a cycle that works much like this. So very often, a client will make a request. They'll ask me for, uh, for some research help. They'll ask me to come in and teach a class. I, as their liaison, I respond and accept that request. I do it fantastically because of course I do in absolutely every situation. Uh, but I complete that request with excellence and the client's satisfied, which is great because that builds the reputation of my work. It builds the reputation of my library. And that gives me something to continue reflecting on and advertising more services. And the problem happens when clients grow and grow and grow. More and more requests occur. And so we have two cycles, and we can even have more cycles building out based on that reputation. This is how we end up overwhelmed and with too many areas we're working in, right? It's not necessarily the worst problem to have, but it is a problem and in some ways self-limiting because, well, if I'm doing too much and burned out, the quality of my work will go down, my reputation may decline, but that might not be what I want for myself or my organization. So in generating this diagram, 
we could think about just this left side um, with more and more services being advertised, requests being made, requests being completed, reputation building. But over here on the right, there are a couple of other things that we could think about, some areas outside of the immediate system. First of all, capacity. So by this, I mean two things. First of all, my ability to take on more work and to do that work with excellence. But also, I could think about the work of my colleagues and uh, who else is in the mix. Are there requests that I could pass on to a different department or a different colleague who has better expertise in an area than I do? Maybe I, as the liaison librarian for physics, optics, and astronomy, don't need to do all of the work for those departments. Maybe there are other people I could pull in to do that work differently. And as, a, as an organization, we can think more broadly about the capacity of our staff and our ability to do good work for the people we work with. We could also spend some time thinking about strategic priorities. What are the goals of the library? What are the goals of these departments? What are they prioritizing as they move forward in their work? Are there areas of focus that I could choose to advertise particular services around? Or are there things that I could give up? Somebody mentioned in the chat, you know, we have so much work going on and we're trying to figure out what to drop. This can be a really prime area, of course, and I'm sure that you thought of this to some extent, but it does stand out when we look at it from a systems approach that our strategic priorities can directly influence what we choose to advertise and where we choose to spend our time. Backing up a little bit, uh, Dieta had mentioned um, both the fifth discipline and the first fifth discipline field book from Peter Senge, Chris Argerus, the rest of the team around this. And they identified a number of archetypes that occur, systems that show up over and over in so many different sorts of organizations and sorts of situations. The one that this example falls into is called the tragedy of the commons. And a lot of you have probably seen this um, elsewhere where there's a common resource that's shared by a number of different people or organizations, and they're all drawing on that resource, which if everybody is looking out for their own interests, they're trying to draw as much of that resource as possible, but there might not be enough of that resource to go around. And we end up either depleting that resource, burning out the liaison in this example, and uh, finding ourselves getting uh, less successful work out of that resource when we're all drawing on it. So this example really does fall very clearly into that archetype. And there are, uh, there are, I wanna say 14 archetypes that they identify. It's roughly 14 archetypes that they identify of systems that we can be on the lookout for and ways for us to categorize the things that we encounter. So I've talked a lot about how we can apply the idea of both looking at the events, patterns, and structures that underlie these sorts of knotty issues that we see in our organizations every day, as well as a tool, causal loop diagramming, that we can use to get our ideas out and maybe see more creative solutions and see how things connect. So a few ways for us to use these skills. First, analyzing complex organizational situations. All of the examples that you all gave are deeply complex. And like Dieta said, they're not gonna be solved today, tomorrow, probably within the next month or years. Um, systems think thinking allows us some tools and abilities to analyze these situations in a, uh, in a complex way that allows for the complexity of our systems. It also lets us find inroads for action. Once we have the picture in front of us, once we understand a little bit more thoroughly what what happens, um, we can begin to identify particular areas that we can try interventions. Um, and then that allows us to broaden the scope of our analysis. We're able to look beyond the immediate system and to begin to identify what affects this system from the outside that we may be able to also think about. I see a couple of questions in the chat right away. So Joanne had asked uh, for more about the archetypes. Really the primary resource uh, for this is the fifth discipline field book that has 
the most detail about these archetypes, um, but also they're discussed in some level of detail in uh, the fifth discipline itself, uh, the smaller black book. Uh, I believe in the appendix of that book, it covers in detail all of those archetypes and then the field book gets into even more detail. So thank you for asking. Um, Steve had asked, do you have a recommendation for a resource to study and build skill in creating these diagrams? That is a great question. And Dieta, I'd be interested to hear from you in a moment if you have anything to suggest. Um, this tool, if you, if you look up resources on causal loop diagramming, you'll see this discussed in a lot of different venues across business, management, uh, organization development. Um, Again, I am going to point you to the Fifth Discipline Field Book. Um, really just a fantastic resource. Um, oh, and uh, Dieta, thank you for mentioning that the, uh, the Leader's New Work article that Jerome uh, posted a link to has just a list of the archetypes. So you can get a quick sense of what's there and what you want to dig into more. Um, but yeah, I would recommend starting with the Fifth Discipline Field Book. Um, and then there's an entire field of systems analysis that uh, that thinks pretty in depth about causal loop diagramming and the kinds of things that we can do with it. I didn't get into all the complexity of what we could do, thinking about um, loops that are self-reinforcing or uh, accelerating, and then loops that are um, balancing or self-limiting. Um, there's a lot more there, but, but I'd start with the Fifth Discipline Field book. Dieta, do you have anything else you'd like to add there? I, I, so this is a wonderful question about the causal loop diagramming and Tyler knows this already about me, but I'm going to go ahead and, and share this. I'm going to be vulnerable with the rest of you. I'm not particularly um, good at causal loop diagramming. It's a little intimidating to me. It's not how my brain works. I am a little bit better with the words. And so I use a more kind of simple model of thinking about kind of events, patterns and structures and then um, really lean on people like Tyler who have more skill in the causal loop diagramming area. I would say though uh, that um, it, it takes some practice. The fifth discipline has some really good examples and they, the kinds of examples that we've shared with you here could get you started. I would also say though that there's other work and organizations that do a good deal of this that help to, um, that, that are involved in the work of like scenario analysis and scenaric thinking. And uh, the University of California at Berkeley um, has housed an organization for years that does a great, tremendous amount of work around scenario analysis and scenaric thinking that is even referenced in the fifth discipline and has been coupled with causal loop diagramming to really start thinking about not necessarily having to know the answer for um, a particular um, problem, but instead what are some of the dynamics that are involved with it and some of the probabilities and your ability to structure for um, understanding and analyzing the, the, the issues surrounding a problem's trend pattern in order to get a sense of probable outcomes, which, is, which is, sounds pretty complicated, but it's actually a really wonderful and structured way of approaching things like trying to um, plan for the future and trying to figure out how um, an issue that is trending up might have implications for something else in the organization that's not at all directly related to or obviously related to the issue that is on your mind at the time. So scenario analysis and scenario thinking are the other two tools that I would suggest um, investigating here. Thanks so much. Are there other questions? We can also, um... I'd, I'd just, I'd love to hear what other questions people might have and uh, Dieta and I might be able to share a little bit more. I'd also point out, um, I'm just going to chime in for another moment here about the article and the article is a really good one and it goes into, it gives kind of lists and examples that wouldn't be as useful for us to share in a webinar because we've supplied the article, but it actually is really interesting um, on page number 18 of that article, the shorter version than the discipline, than the fifth discipline itself, it, it talks about how uh, the approach to charting strategic dilemmas, that's the subsection. And it talks about different ways of doing that and mapping is one, but it goes into other examples of things like processing and framing or contextualizing or sequencing 
or waving and cyclist cycling or synergizing. So even though we're giving you very specific examples, there are other ways that you might approach this that might be um, more useful given the specific issue or dilemma that you're wrestling with and or given your uh, kind of stylistic approach that I just want to point out on page 18 of the Leaders New Work article that we shared in the chat window. Steve, I see you have another question. Uh, so the question there is, do you usually build these diagrams in a group or have one person create the framework and hone as a group? Uh, I think that's a great question. Uh, Dieta, I'd also be interested to hear your thoughts, but I have a couple of thoughts as well. Um, I think either approach can work. It does depend though on what group you have and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and there are benefits of both approaches. So the kinds of things I'm thinking about. In a complex systems level scenario of the kinds that we're talking about, everyone has very different mental models of what bears on a particular system and what effects there might be. So if your group is really good at brainstorming together and at balancing um, all voices in the room and leveraging the power of the group in that way, it may be productive to do that as a group. Another approach though, which you suggest is having one person get started and then honing as a group, or even better, having everybody um, work individually at first on a particular problem, first let's define our topic. What system are we examining? What problem are we trying to solve? What are we trying to change? And then ask the group, once we define the topic, go away for a few minutes. Maybe this happens during the meeting, you take five minutes individually, maybe it's pre-work for a meeting, to think about what bears on this topic and what kinds of factors should we be thinking about? And then if with everyone coming to the, uh, to the full group, with their individual thinking, which also uh, as an equity topic, allows people who are able to participate in different ways to do so successfully uh, and to bring their wisdom to the group. We can then take all of those diagrams or lists or events, patterns, structures, analysis that everyone's done and generate a better diagram together. Dieta, do you have any further thoughts on that? I, I agree with what you just said, Tyler, that thinking of different approaches for, to take into consideration different styles that people have as far as approaching learning, but remembering that the, the opportunity for systems thinking is to be able to get a variety of different people and perspectives, not just solving a problem, but understanding it differently. And also to know that innovation um, and creativity require uh, differing points of view. It requires a dissenting point of view. It requires people who are going to ask questions, who are going to say, well, why haven't we tried that before? Or why, do, why are we so quickly saying that that's not possible, that we tried it again, that we tried it last year? Like, why is it that we approached it in this way in the past? Those kinds of why or how questions are going to be incredibly useful to wrestle with as you dig more deeply into these knotty problems. And so really coming to a place where people are owning the problem, are seeing it in, as, as an analytical opportunity and not as a, an emotionally embroiling situation, and also where they're understanding it and understanding the different perspectives in a way that allows for the dynamics of the problem to be unearthed is a tremendous opportunity. Again, if one person could have figured this out on their own, it would have been done by now, right? And so the, the opportunity here is to take advantage of the, the diversity of your teams. And, and, and that means not just people from different identities, but also people from different ranks and parts of the organization really looking at things and asking what we in the consulting world call those innocent questions that will really allow for a deeper and richer kind of understanding and explanation. So remember, remember that you're trying to learn, not just solve. So I see, I see a couple more questions coming in. Um, 
So yeah, I'll pose this one from Elizabeth to you. She says, in looking for leverage points, how do you move beyond the obvious ones? That is the ones that can probably only be implemented by people above your pay grade. Well, this is this is a this is the the question that comes up quite regularly. Is um, you know if these if it requires somebody who has a higher pay grade than us to solve it. Um, I, I actually believe that all of us need to work together um, and, uh, and, and value the contributions and insights and perspectives. So one opportunity could be to identify potential areas of leverage and um, either get early on kind of early adopter champions or advocates or allies who have more privilege or power or access um, in the organization than you do. Um, early in that process or really early after you've identified some potential areas of leverage. I mean, maybe you do some of the heavy lifting initially, you and a team of people, and then very quickly move to enlisting a champion to explore possibilities for acting on, these, on, on one of these leverage points. Now, the opportunity there is going to be how to pitch this right, so that it, you, you can actually make some headway. And so it may be saying, this is the methodical approach that we took. Here are the, here's the process that we used. Here are some of the things that we, that we found. Here are some of the um, reasons why we think that this particular action would lead us to a more satisfying outcome than we've had in the past and what resources would be necessary in order for that to happen. And, and sometimes those resources are very much in the form of getting executive leadership support or buy-in. But again, being able to have a really concrete ask about what executive leadership support or buy-in looks like or entails is going to be important. But maybe you do some of the heavy lifting first and then put together a concise and more analytical rather than emotional, potentially kind of rationale for um, allocating resources because it will be in the service of something that the organization has already identified as um, consistent with our goals and our values. So I see a, a question from, um, from Francine and, and, and Tyler, I'll, I'll read it out. And if you, wanna, if you wanna answer it, go for it. How do you make an impact on a larger structure if it is far above the area, um, the areas you have any influence on? We're losing staff because larger institution is having budget problems due to demographic shifts in the entire population. These structures are far beyond what I personally have influence on. Yeah, thanks, Dieta. I, I do have a couple of thoughts, and I, I think your answer to the last question covers a good deal of this, but looking a little bit further, um, I want to zoom in on something else that we said earlier, which is that systems thinking isn't only about solving problems, but about understanding problems. Often, from uh, from higher reaches of an organization, it can be so hard to see what factors are actually playing into a situation that the organization is encountering. You have, from those higher reaches, less access to information, less honest feedback, less complete feedback. And so the organization can become very opaque and hard to understand. So I think the power uh, that Francine, those of us who are lower in the ranks of an organization and don't have influence on all of the structures, the power that we have is information. And using systems thinking to better understand a problem and to understand it in a way that administration may not directly be able to see. And like Dieta said, to understand that and be able to pitch it in a way that's concise, that speaks to strategic priorities, that speaks to goals. Um, it can't guarantee that you're gonna have the outcome that you want, but in being able to more fully understand a problem and to be able to present what you found, it gives you a much better shot at both getting, uh, getting in front of a problem as well as helping to build relationships uh, between parts of the organization. Dieta, do you have any other thoughts on that? The, the only last thing that I would contribute is that you know, sometimes the enormity of issues keeps us from doing anything at all. This is a huge equity issue, right? When we talk about the systems thinking, one of the, a great example, as we shared earlier in this webinar, was around how uh, 
you know, systems thinking it comes up related to diversity. And it's also a wonderful way to think about what's happened with kind of equity issues that are surfacing in your own organizations and that we're talking about so heavily everywhere lately. But a lot of times related to equity, what we realize is, oh my goodness, there are so many things that need to be fixed that we don't do anything. We say, well, if we touch this one thing, then this other thing is, is revealed. And then this other thing becomes more apparent. And oh my goodness, there are all these things that are beyond our direct sphere of influence that we'll never have an impact on. So let's just hold tight and not do anything until, we, until the, the, the environment is more favorable for us. Here's the tricky part. It doesn't really work like that, right? We have no evidence that the environment is all of a sudden going to shift and things are going to be lined up perfectly for us to be able to tackle some of these knotty issues. We, that has not happened yet. So what, what, we, what, what instead we might do is, is maybe position ourselves to kind of have the, the gumption to say we have to go forward, but also really think about what language we can use to say, okay, folks, let's think about the cost of doing nothing. Right? And is that consistent with our mission, with our aspirations, with our goals, with our values? What are some of the short term and longer term implications and impacts that are going to be negative that we actually cannot palate, that we cannot live with? And so having some of those hard conversations and even being willing to put on the table the conversation about the cost of doing nothing and how that has potentially put us in a, in a, in a, in a bad position currently is something that we really need to, um, you know, take heed, to really take seriously, and then position ourselves to to be able and willing to go forward in the future, knowing that we don't have control over everything, but doing nothing is not an option. Yep, and Hannah, I love what you just said. We, I really, that sometimes I find myself stuck because trying to get the right solution. Sometimes right is exactly not is exactly the wrong question to be asking. And I'm not saying this negatively, Hannah, but what I'm saying is sometimes it's how do we how do we move forward, right? What what are our aspirations that are about progress, about learning, about levels of engagement, about new perspective? Um, and think about it. Anything that require anything that's going to be new or creative or innovative or where we're going to have a breakthrough, we're also going to have sometimes we don't get it right the first time. That's not how new, innovative breakthrough experiences happen. And so let's go for progress in the right direction. Let's go for learning and let's give ourselves maybe a different way to measure success rather than it has to be perfect first time out or we don't do anything. I agree wholeheartedly, Jill, exactly what you just said. I agree. And also jumping back up to something that Steve contributed, um, that one of the benefits is changing the way that people above are thinking or talking about an issue. He said it can be a long process and mean losing credit, but the effects can be surprising. I absolutely agree that so often we get stuck in a particular narrative of how a system works, what's not working, and, um, the th and stuck on the factors that we can't change. Um, and so, yeah, I very much agree. Having this process for thinking more broadly about what effects we may be able to leverage or other ways for us to think about an issue can be really powerful. With that said, I want to thank you for a really rich discussion today. I know webinars are tricky sometimes and we're working on a chat window, but it's been really wonderful um, having this input from you and really having the level of engagement. Tyler, thank you for drawing those amazing causal loop diagrams. <laughs> what I can. <laughs> Folks, we're going to put in the chat window a link to some additional resources. So we've given you some of the resources related to systems thinking specifically, but we also want to let you know that we have other um, opportunities, professional development opportunities that might be useful for you. So Jerome is putting in information about um, our, our new online pr uh, program that is jam packed with really practical tools like the kind that we've been working through today. And we'd love for you to visit the landing page and learn a little more or register or register as many people as are interested from your organization, we would really love to continue working with you. Tyler, any closing thoughts for us? 
Uh, not much. Thank you all so much for your participation. This has been uh, really fantastic to see your thoughts and feedback. And um, we will be sharing a recording of this webinar. And uh, we had also shared the link to some of the pre-work if we want to take those questions or if you want to bring those questions uh, to other places in your organization to frame your discussion. Please feel free to use those. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much for being part of our learning journey. Have a great week. Thank you all.